Well, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Andrew Thompson from Caltech. He's the professor in environmental science and engineering. He's a physical oceanographer studying the ocean's role in Earth's climate using a variety of tools to study um, you know, aspects of the ocean from large scale circulation to turbulence. And he uses high resolution modeling, remote sensing analysis, deployment of autonomous vehicles. And today, he's going to talk to us about the circulation of the Antarctic margins. Welcome. All right, uh, this should be on. Thanks, Joao. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Uh, just kind of getting over a cold, so hopefully my voice will, uh, will last out. Uh, this is a really nice opportunity for me to talk about some of the work that my group has been doing over the past four or five years down at Caltech. Uh, it's going to focus on the circulation of the Antarctic margins. Uh, here are some of the collaborators that have worked on this. Especially, like to point out Andrew Stewart, a former postdoc uh, with me, now a faculty member at UCLA, uh, Sally Zhang, Xiaozhu Ran, who are uh, graduate students at Caltech. Uh, and then some work I've been doing with Ron Kwok and Tom Armitage here at JPL. And one of the really nice reasons for being able to talk about this work is that uh, what you'll see here, a lot of this has been funded under the President and Directors Fund, uh, which has tried to increase collaboration between campus and JPL. Uh, and this has been a really important way for moving some of this work forward. OK, so let's see if this works. OK, so I thought I'd start off by trying to uh, orient the non-oceanographers, at least in the room, or people who haven't looked at the Southern Ocean. So what I'm showing here is a schematic of the Southern Ocean. And there are four major circulation features. The really the dominant one uh, is this eastward current here. It goes from west to east all the way around Antarctica is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. Uh, and this circumpolar current is actually mirrored by another current at the shelf break here, which actually goes around in the opposite sense and is known as the Antarctic Slope Current. And it's really what we're going to focus on today. Now, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current is actually the biggest circulation feature in the entire global system. It carries 150 spurge-ups of transport. Spurge-ups is a term that oceanographers use. So 150 spurge-ups is uh, 150 times 10 to the 6 uh, cubic meters of water every single second. Um, what, to kind of get a better sense of what that means, surface velocities in the ACC might be about a meter a second, um, but it's almost barotropic, so it doesn't decay very much with depth. Now, the Antarctic slope current actually carries uh, somewhat less transport, more like 20 spurge ups. Uh, however, um, the difference here uh, is that the Antarctic slope current, whereas the ACC is a continuous current that just sort of spins around Antarctica, the Antarctic slope current actually starts somewhere here in this region called the Bellinghausen Sea, spins up, and then sort of decays somewhere around here in the Antarctic Peninsula. So the fact that you actually have to spin up this current and then it dies means that that's a significant amount of transport that has to be started. Now I'm going to talk a little bit later in the talk about some of the similarities between the ACC uh, and what we call the ASC, or the Antarctic Slow Current. But one of the things that uh, is interesting here is that there are two major uh, gyres. So one is the Ross gyre here, one is the Weddell gyre, that in some ways buffer the ASC, or the Antarctic Slope Current, from the ACC in some regions. Uh, but in other regions, say in East Antarctica, that's not there. And so we'll sort of look at how the geometry of the gyres here play a role in setting the interactions between the ACC uh, and the ASC. Now, one of the reasons why we're interested in the circulation at the Antarctic margins has to do with how the ocean is taking up heat. Um, so I'm showing two nice papers here that come from work from Sarah Gilley, who's down at Scripps. Uh, this was some early work done in 2002, which looked at float data in the Southern Ocean, and for the first time tried to draw a map of how temperatures were changing in the Southern Ocean. Okay, and you can actually see from this map that largely the information is coming from this Antarctic Circumpolar Current. There's a lot less information from around the Antarctic margins, and I'll, I'll show you how we've been able to update that in a minute. Uh, but what you see is that there's pretty much circumpolar warming. Okay? And the rates are relatively large. Okay? So you're looking here in this orange and yellow. Uh, it's roughly something like a tenth of a degree per decade. Okay? So say 0.01. Uh, degrees C per year. Uh, and this is largely measured or averaged over the upper ocean. And then Sarah went back and did some work later on. Uh, this is now looking at the vertical structure of that warming. Uh, this is temperatures referenced to 1990. And so you can see this goes from the 30s uh, every decade up to the 2000s. And again, you see this very strong signal of warming in the Southern Ocean. Okay, and so the story I want to tell today is, is, is less a story about how the ocean is taking up heat. Okay, and there's two different processes that could lead to this warming. It could very simply be that the ocean is taking up heat from the atmosphere. Uh, it could also be that there's a shift 
right, and where these currents are. And in fact, in this study, Sarah talked a little bit about a, a poleward shift of the AC that leads to the heating. Um, but as I said, the story I want to tell today is, is less about how the ocean's taking up heat, but where this heat is actually going. Where is this heat actually leaving the ocean? Okay, and so um, the reason why that's important, this is a, a paper that came out in Nature uh, 2016, fairly recently. Um, so what I'm showing here is a map here of the elevation of Antarctica, and on the right uh, is ice thickness. Uh, most of you in the room will be familiar with this, but what you find uh, is that a large portion of Antarctica, uh, and in particular in West Antarctica, so this region here, uh, is actually below sea level. Okay? And what we're going to see uh, on the right-hand side are two different simulations uh, for two representative carbon pathways uh, looking at estimates uh, at how uh, ice thickness might change at different times. So this is an estimate uh, 2,500. So this is a pretty conservative estimate about how carbon might change. But what I really want to emphasize uh, is this picture here. So this is a much more uh, aggressive estimate of what uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere might look like. Uh, but the important thing here is that almost all the ice from West Antarctica uh, has been lost. And the estimate from this paper, again, this is for 2,500, would be about 15 meters uh, of sea level rise. Now, this particular simulation was a uh, somewhat novel simulation where they introduced different types of uh, ice stabilities, in particular, is this marine ice cliff instability in the simulation, uh, which, you know, the dynamics of that are fairly uncertain, uh, but I really just want to put this up as in this is sort of uh, not implausible uh, that much of West Antarctica uh, could be lost under different climate change scenarios. Now, if we think about how you might lose ice, we're going to see in a minute uh, that there's two different ways about, of doing this. Uh, as the atmosphere warms, Obviously, you can, uh, you can melt from above, but what we're going to see in this next slide is that the ocean can also play a major role in this as well. And I wanted to just show this schematic picture, uh, again, for people who may not uh, thought about the Antarctic margins before, to kind of get a sense of what the geometry of the Antarctic margins look like. So you would have uh, the Antarctic continent here to the left. Uh, as those ice sheets are being compressed under their own weight, the ice gets pushed out to the side, and eventually, at some point, that ice will actually lift off the bedrock and will actually begin to float. And this is what we call these marine ice shelves that ring the margins of Antarctica. And we're going to look at how those have been changing. Uh, but what happens when these ice shelves begin to float is that there is a region underneath that ice shelf okay, that is obviously flooded by the ocean. We call this cavity. And there is a circulation within that cavity. Okay, so we have water coming onto the shelf, circulating under this cavity, and moving out. The ice at the end of the ice shelf can calve. We also have sea ice, uh, and that's really important. So in the ocean, the density of seawater depends on both temperature and salinity. Throughout most of the ocean, temperature is quite a good proxy for the density. So you have warm water at the surface, cold water at depth. But that changes at the poles. Uh, the reason for that is you have a strong hydrological cycle in terms of growing and melting sea ice, such that around Antarctica, that surface water is very, very fresh and can also be cold. And what that means is you actually go into Antarctica, and we'll see this in a minute, and you actually look for where that warm water is. It sits not at the surface, but it sits at depth. Okay? And in particular, it sits pretty much right here at the shelf break. And so the ability for that warm water to get onto the shelf and then circulate under the ice determines where that melting happens and how strong that melting actually is. Okay? And I'll actually show uh, a picture here of what a typical uh, temperature structure looks like. So these are from some observations that I'll show you in a minute. This here is depth. This is distance offshore or longitude. Here's your continental shelf, the shelf break, and the slope. What I'm showing here is temperature. And you can see this big slug of warm water sitting just off the shelf. Uh, it's warm with respect to the freezing temperature, which is about minus 1.8 in this region. Uh, so it's about half a degree. And you can see a picture here of, of this warm water sort of intruding onto the shelf. And what I'm going to talk about today are what are the processes by which that happens. And this is actually a, a summertime measurement. So there is some warm water at the top here, which is just due to seasonal heating. Uh, but in general, you have this cold, fresh water sitting on top. Uh, the one other thing that's in the schematic that I should mention is the, the surface forcing coming from the atmosphere. So the wind stress forcing does play a role here. Uh, so depending on the direction of the winds, when you apply uh, a wind stress to the ocean surface, because the Earth is rotating, it actually drives a transport that's perpendicular to the winds. Okay? And so in particular, 
at the Antarctic margins, you tend to have winds coming from the east to the west, and that gives rise to a surface transport that is actually onshore, okay, which would be to the left in this picture. And that also will be part of the story about what the total transport onto the shelf is in the system. OK, so as a way of introduction, I've been showing some of you some very schematic pictures of what uh, the Southern Ocean looks like in terms of the circulation, uh, in terms of the geometry. And again, that's just to sort of orient ourselves. And what I'd like to emphasize now is that the system is very complex. Okay? And it's a very, very turbulent system. So I want to show you, hopefully this works, uh, a beautiful simulation that comes from a numerical model uh, that uh, was really thanks to Demetrius Menemenlis, who's sitting uh, in the front here. This is, let me get this up and running. And this is actually a global uh, 148th of a degree ocean model. Uh, it's just the um, highest resolution global model that's ever been run. Uh, and I'm actually just showing you a small region of that ocean. What you're looking at here is this Waddell Gyre. Okay, so here's the Antarctic Peninsula. The ACC would be out here. And what you're looking at is just temperature uh, on a depth surface. And so this is some work that's actually been done by uh, Andrew Stewart and Demetrius. Uh, looking at this turbulent structure of the Antarctic margins. Okay? And so what you see, remember I said that there's to the schematic picture of this Antarctic slope current that moves from east to west around the Antarctic margins. But what I want to emphasize here is sitting on top of that is all this very high frequency variability. So there's not actually a time scale on this movie, um, but what you're looking at, I, I believe, is roughly about uh, a year simulation. Uh, and so you see all these turbulent eddies here, you can see their role in actually stirring up this temperature. Uh, if you look in particular up in this region, uh, they play a very strong role, this high frequency variability, and actually dri driving these warm waters, warm uh, waters up onto the shelf. And so a lot of the classical pictures we've had of what governs the dynamics of uh, these, an these Antarctic margins here have to be updated based on this new picture we have of this being a very, very turbulent system. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. OK, so what I'm kind of getting into the, the main results now, there's going to be three parts of this talk. Uh, I'd like to start with giving an overview of some of the observations that have really changed our perspective uh, of what the Antarctic margins look like. This will largely be based on a regional perspective. So we've gone to very specific regions around Antarctica and made some very high resolution measurements. And then from that, we begin to look at some more process-based models, so really trying to understand uh, the dynamics uh, of what's setting the heat and momentum budgets around Antarctica. And from this, we start to understand why different regions might look differently. But ultimately, where we'd like to get to is to have some understanding of what the circumpolar variability looks like. And we've made some progress on this just in the last year with some of the work I've been doing with Ron Kwok and Tom Armitage. So I'll, I'll finish uh, with those results. OK. So let's start by looking at observations of trends and variabilities at the Antarctic margins. So remember I told you that uh, we have this information about what the trends are in temperature, uh, kind of in the ACC, but we have less information of what's happening uh, around the coast. That's not completely true. We have, have done some work on this. Again, the motivation here is this picture. Uh, here's Antarctica, and you can see all the way around Antarctica here, there's these colored regions. These are these floating ice shelves. Uh, around Antarctica. And what these colors are indicating in this picture is the rate of change. Okay, so this is the rate, the change in thickness uh, per time, which is actually showing uh, the thinning, or in some cases, the growth uh, of these different ice shelves. Now, what you see from this picture is there's some pretty significant regional variations around Antarctica. And you can see, for the most part, in the Weddell Gyre and around East Antarctica, these ice shelves have uh, only been thinning by a small amount or really not changing very much at all. Uh, and that can be contrasted to what's happening in West Antarctica. And so what you see in particular in this region in the Amundsen Sea uh, and in the Bellinghausen Sea, you're seeing a thinning of these ice shelves uh, that's on the order of uh, tens of meters uh, per decade. Now, what's interesting when you look at that regional variability uh, is that it actually corresponds with two different regimes of what the ocean looks like around the Antarctic margins. Okay, and again, so that you're seeing the same sort of picture here. This is from an earlier paper showing rate of change in ice shelf thickness. But now there's this lighter color scale here, which is actually showing the temperature at the seafloor around the Antarctic margins. 
And again, you see two very different pictures here around most of East Antarctica and the Weddell Sea. You have a seafloor temperature that's relatively cold, so this is this cold water regime. And then all the way around West Antarctica, you actually have warm water. Okay, so this is places where warm water is actually penetrating onto the shelf. And we sort of understand why this is happening. These cold water regimes tend to be places where you're making uh, Antarctic bottom water, so very, very dense water. Uh, whereas around West Antarctica, you have two things happening. Uh, the circumpolar current, Antarctic circumpolar current penetrating towards the coast and also a region where you're not uh, making Antarctic bottom water. Now, this picture here actually just shows the temperature and it's actually not showing how that temperature changes. Um, so I can actually show you uh, one study we've worked on here to try to uh, estimate what some of those changes look like. So what I'm showing on the left here is really that same picture. So this is the temperature, once again, at the seafloor, all the way around Antarctica. You see very clearly there are these two regimes, warm water in West Antarctica, cold water everywhere else. Uh, but now what we've done on the right-hand side is taken all of the observations that are available uh, in, in full disclosure. Uh, there are places around Antarctica where we just don't have very many observations. So you can see that large regions of Antarctica here are showing this hatched. Uh, region where the, the um, statistics are not quite significant, but sort of overall you get this picture that in those regions where you have warm water at the sea floor, that water is also warming. So you actually see warming trends in West Antarctica. Uh, this unit here is a little bit uh, of an odd one, but 10 on this unit would be roughly a change of about uh, a tenth of a degree per decade. Uh, so that's fairly rapid warming. Um, we can also do similar uh, similar sort of analysis at the water off the shelf. So remember, we think that this uh, water is coming from this warm water off the shelf. And so what I'm showing you now is this temperature of what we call circumpolar deep water. So remember I told you that the maximum temperature is not at the surface, but it actually sits uh, below the surface. So what I'm plotting here is the temperature everywhere around Antarctica where the temperature maximum is. Okay, and so you see you have warmer water here off uh, West Antarctica than you do in the Waddell Gyre. And we also looked at the rate of change of that circumpolar uh, deep water with time. And so what you see is that that offshore water is also warming with time. Okay, so that warm circumpolar deep water surrounding Antarctica is also warming. Now, this is fairly interesting, but it, it's really just thermodynamics. The last thing I want to show you, uh, I at least found uh, particularly interesting because I think it has more to do with dynamics. Uh, and that picture is actually this one. So now I'm actually showing you the depth at which that circumpolar deep water resides. Okay, so it is the depth where that temperature maximum occurs. And what you see here is, is a very different picture for different regions around Antarctica. So if I look, for instance, in the Waddell Gyre, okay, you can see that that circumpolar deep water is relatively shallow. So it's about 300 decibars, which is equivalent to 300 meters. And then that circumpolar deep water dips towards the coast. So the picture you have is this bowl of that warm water tilting down towards the sides. Uh, and that's true in the Waddell Gyre and here in the Ross Gyre as well. And you should contrast that to what you see in West Antarctica where that circumpolar deep water is deep off the shelf. And as you move in towards the shelf break, that circumpolar deep water shoals. Okay, so once again, we see another mechanism by which circumpolar deep water gets onto the shelf here is, is along uh, density surfaces that are actually shoaling towards the coast. And so the last picture here is showing that not only is this water off the shelf warming, okay, but the depth of that circumpolar deep water is also getting shallower. Okay, so not only is this water getting warmer, but it's shallower in the water column, which gives it greater access to the continental shelf. Okay, another reason why we're seeing that warming on the shelf. Now, a question is, you know, why are these changes occurring? Um, Again, I sort of made this argument that the Antarctic margins are this turbulent location. I want to show you one other set of observations that has sort of helped us to understand that. And one of the ways that my group has actually been looking at the Antarctic margins uh, has been using this tool here, something we call ocean gliders. Um, for those who have not seen these before, uh, these are autonomous uh, ocean robots. One of the neat thing about them is that they are able to propel themselves simply by changing their buoyancy. So they move up and down in the water column uh, by actually displacing more or less volume. Uh, and the fact that they have these wings here uh, on the sides and uh, a weight inside, it's actually a battery pack that can sort of move forwards and backwards and rotate due to uh, some eccentricity uh, in the battery pack, 
allows you to actually maneuver these through the water column. And the fact that they don't uh, actually have any propulsion means that they don't use very much power, and we can leave them out for very, very long periods of time. They tend to sample at pretty high spatial resolution and temporal resolution, which has allowed us to look at high frequency variability. Um, we've done a number of observational studies, uh, both in the Wood LC and Drake Passage, and we have a, a project coming up in the Bellinghausen Sea later this year. Uh, I'm really just going to focus here on the results uh, in the Wood LC. So if I actually show you the map of the region we've been looking at, again, I've sort of showed you this picture of the uh, numerical simulation from the Wood LC. You have the Antarctic slope front here moving up along the eastern side of the peninsula uh, and reaching the tip of the peninsula. And what I'm going to show you is a series of sections across this frontal current uh, at the tip of the peninsula. Now, when we actually went out to do this experiment, the original plan, uh, this is actually where we deployed the gliders, and we were just going to run the gliders back and forth across the shelf break here and look at the frontal current and try to do as many sections as we could to start to get some statistical idea of what the properties of this frontal current looks like. Uh, unfortunately, when we actually got out there that year, the sea ice was much further out in the Wood Algyre than uh, had been in previous years. We was also a, a very large iceberg that was roughly the size of LA County that was sort of uh, chasing us along this uh, shelf break here. And so what we ended up doing was doing a number of sections uh, along the shelf break uh, in the continental shelf up through the northwestern side of the Wood Algyre. Uh, this experiment lasted for uh, about two, two and a half months, so from January to March, uh, and we had a second glider sort of out on the side here. Uh, I've sort of already showed you this picture before. This gives you a sense of what the gliders do. So as I said, they profile up and down, uh, but also along the continental shelf and the slope. And what I'm showing you here is a picture of temperature from which uh, we can make maps uh, of what this temperature looks like. And again, the picture here is of this warm water uh, uh, being moving onto the shelf, but not in a sort of continuous way, but rather being shed onto the shelf uh, with these uh, temperature anomalies or these eddies. And this is just sort of a, uh, a picture of the temperature and salinity distribution in this region, again, showing sort of this very strong frontal feature here. What was somewhat surprising uh, when we went and looked at these observations, again, the picture had always been that there was this very strong front that sat right at the shelf break, uh, and that was the Antarctic Slope current, uh, and that was really the main circulation feature. What I'm showing here are a number of sections showing the velocity field along the continental shelf and slope. So this is depth. This, again, is distance uh, or latitude and longitude along the shelf and slope. And what you see is that there's not a single frontal current. Okay, but there's actually a number of very small scale fronts that sit on the slope. You always tend to have this, this strong velocity feature right here at the shelf break. Uh, so these red currents indicate uh, a velocity into the, into the um, screen here, what would be a northward flow. Uh, it's always this bottom intensified current, um, but you can see you have these bands of very strong velocities all along the slope. Um, and you can actually do, this is uh, for people who have looked at this before, uh, you can use the fact that uh, there's a topographic slope here uh, that gives rise to what we call a, a gradient potential vorticity uh, from which you can define a Rhine scale. Topographic Rhine scale actually defines uh, how many of these jets you'd expect to see, or at least the separation, uh, and this seems to do fairly well in this region. One of the things we are able to do really for the first time uh, with this data, oops, Oops, that's, I'm sorry, that slide's not in there. Uh, but we, are, we could take all of these sections and sort of put them together in terms of composite and start to look at deviations away uh, from that composite. And what you begin to see is a lot of the variability sits right here at the shelf break. Now, the last thing we were able to do with these observations uh, is we were begin to go uh, look all the way around this northwestern side of the Wood Algyre and begin to look at how the density structure was changing. Okay, and what we found is everywhere we looked, uh, what I'm showing here is a plot. This is distance from the shelf break, so this would be up on the shelf. This would be over the continental slope. Uh, and what I'm showing here uh, is the strength of uh, what we call the potential vorticity. Okay? And the important thing, really, just for this picture, is what you see is that there's a uniform gradient, and it sort of varies from section to section, but all of these sections have this large scale gradient from offshore to onshore which implies that there is a, uh, an eddy flux uh, of heat and mass onshore. 
And what I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, some numerical simulations that sort of verify that this picture is true. Uh, but it allowed us to sort of construct this schematic picture of what we think, think the circulation looks like. And there's really three parts to it. The, the top here uh, is an onshore surface segment transport, which is largely due to the surface wind forcing and the frictional transport. In regions where you make dense water on the shelf, uh, it sort of cascades off the shelf and you have this offshore transport. Uh, but the last thing here is this region in the middle, which is where your warmest water sits, okay, that has to move up onto the shelf. And the way that this water actually moves onto the shelf, shelf as I'll show you uh, in a moment, is not through uh, a, a slow mean flow, uh, but rather through fluctuations in uh, the current on this density surface that are correlated with anomalies in temperature. And so what you have is what we call this eddy heat flux onto the shelf into this density surface. And it's moderated by the change in the thickness of this density class, so the change in the thickness of this warm circumpolar deep water. OK, and so this is the last thing I want to show. I, I mentioned briefly that later this year, we'll be going down to the Bellinghausen Sea. Uh, so this is another uh, snapshot from numerical simulation. This is one actually run uh, by Michael Schadlock, who very kindly uh, loaned this picture to us for, a, for the proposal that we wrote. You're seeing here, this is the Antarctic Peninsula, but now we're on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula. And again, this is a very special location because this is the region where uh, I said at the beginning, this is where the Antarctic slope con current actually gets initialized. So what you see here, this black line is the shelf break. Uh, these contours are showing the bathymetry, so there's a big trough here. Once again, you're looking at vorticity, so this is a very uh, turbulent region. Uh, but if we look upstream of this trough and downstream of this trough, what we see is that the velocity structure looks very, very different. In particular, to the north, the flow is moving to the east along the shelf break. And on the other side of the trough, you have the flow moving to the west. Okay? And so something happens in this region that causes the circulation to move off to the west and generate the slope current here, uh, where the ACC sort of runs into the boundary and moves off to the east in this region. The dynamics that sort of initiate the slope current here are not very well understood. This is part of the motivation for going into the Bellinghausen Sea. Um, the Bellinghausen Sea is also a, a special place because it is a region where we're seeing the ice shelf melt very, very rapidly. Um, I'll just show this sort of as the last picture. Um, we had one study actually looking at this, which was using not these uh, robotic ocean gliders, but actually using instrumented seals. Okay, so this was actually a study that was led by a graduate student at Caltech. Um, actually, in, instrumenting marine mammals has been a remarkably beneficial way of actually increasing the number of observations that we have in the Southern Ocean, which are very difficult places to go to. Uh, what you're seeing here in this map, again, this is the Bellinghausen Sea, so the Antarctic Peninsula would be up here. Everywhere where you see these gray dots are actually places where we have a vertical profile, where we measure temperature and salinity uh, from, these, from these seals. Okay, and so you can see we have lots of measurements here. Uh, along West Antarctica. It's a little bit more sparse here in the western side of the Bellinghausen Sea. Um, but some of these profiles are colored. Okay? All of these profiles that are colored are places where we actually detect detected meltwater coming from these ice shelves in the southern part of the Bellinghausen Sea. So uh, the colors here are indicating the depth of where that meltwater is. The size is actually indicating the thickness of that meltwater layer. Um, but what you get from this meltwater calculation is you begin to get a sense of the circulation in this region, and in particular, this meltwater that's happening uh, along these ice shells, moving up along the western side of the Belgic trough here, and actually giving rise to this, this slope front current and carrying this meltwater to the west. Um, so once again, you know, we'll be in this region uh, later this year to start looking at what the frontal structure looks like, uh, both in the Belgic, Belling, uh, Belgic trough uh, and both downstream and upstream of the Bellinghausen Sea. OK, so um, between both the, the very high resolution numerical simulations and these observations we have, we get the indication again that the, the Antarctic margins are this very turbulent system. Um, I'm going to show you just very quickly a few slides looking at sort of the, the fluid dynamical properties uh, of the Antarctic margins. And one of the important things to remember here, it sort of motivates this idea that you have uh, these mesoscale eddies playing a very important role here, uh, is that you're in, uh, uh, for the ocean at least, uh, you're in a rotating system where uh, you can define a non-dimensional number, it being the Rosby number, uh, and it tends to be small. And what's important in that case is that if you have pressure gradients in a system, okay, they're actually balanced by 
uh, the Coriolis term such that the velocity field tends to be perpendicular to the pressure gradient. Okay. Now, for most of the ocean, that's, that's fine because you can support pressure gradients, for instance, across uh, different continents. But when we move into the Southern Ocean, where you have circumpolar flows, uh, there's an interesting result that comes out of this. And that is, if I were to imagine, for instance, this is the Antarctic circumpolar current. Uh, and if I were to integrate the pressure gradient all the way around my very idealized Antarctica here, uh, I start from the first place, I come back uh, to the beginning, uh, that pressure gradient has to just integrate to zero. And the implication is, is that I cannot support a mean circulation uh, across this line of latitude in this case. And so at the very least, uh, if I'm actually going to have transport across this line, uh, it can't be carried by a smooth uniform flow across here, but rather has to be carried by uh, an eddy transport. So correlations between fluctuations uh, in the velocity field and changes in, in uh, density. Now this certainly holds, uh, this has a big constraint on what happens in the Antarctic circumpolar current. Uh, as we move to the Antarctic margins, uh, we can see that there are some similarities here in terms of the Antarctic slope front. Uh, it is a near circumpolar current, but there are some differences as well. And so if we kind of look at well, what's similar and what's different here, uh, the Antarctic slope, current, slope front uh, is a near circumpolar current, um, although it's much, much more strongly influenced by bathymetry. So the fact that this sits at the shelf break uh, and over the continental slope will very strongly constrain the different types of turbulent characteristics you have. Uh, in the ACC, the wind forcing is predominantly from westerlies. Uh, as we mentioned, we moved to the Antarctic margins. Uh, you have easterlies. And then the question is, you know, to what degree is there an interaction between these two currents? It's certainly stronger in West Antarctica uh, than it is in the regions where you have the Ross Gyre uh, and the Weddell Gyre. So we've studied this uh, in a couple different ways. Again, uh, here's a very schematic picture. Uh, the, the areas that we're going to focus on here uh, will have transport happening at the surface due to the wind stress. Uh, we may be in regions where you're making dense water on the shelf uh, that's going to cascade off. But we're really going to focus now uh, what happens in the circumpolar deep water layer. So that's what brings that warm water on the shelf. And I really just want to show you uh, a set of simulations here that were run uh, this was led by Andrew Stewart when he was a postdoc at Caltech. So we've set up quite an idealized system here. You can see the bathymetry. There's a continental shelf and a slope. Uh, this particular model is, is what we call zonally symmetric, so it doesn't vary at all in the east-west direction. Uh, what I'm showing here is just a snapshot of salinity and temperature from the simulation. Again, you can see the system stratified in salinity, salinity so it's fresh at the surface. Uh, it's saltier at depth. Uh, and this allows you to have a temperature structure where your temperature maximum sort of sits at about 500 meters. And you can already see from the snapshot here that you're seeing the shedding of that warm water onto the shelf. And so what we've done with this simulation is just, again, divided this into three regions. You have your surface transport onto the shelf. Uh, you may have some transport off uh, along the bottom due to making dense water on the shelf. And what we're going to focus on is how that changes that uh, warm water moving onto the shelf. In this particular simulation, the way we make dense water on the shelf here is just introducing uh, a flux of salinity, which actually makes that water denser. Uh, and that's just held constant. And then there are a number of parameters you can change, strength of the wind stress, the position, how wide the slope is. And I just want to show you two different sets of simulations. The first one uh, is very simply changing the strength of the easterly winds that are applied here at the shelf break. Uh, and what you have on the y-axis here is that transport either on uh, or off the shelf. And so what you find is as you increase the wind stress, uh, that surface water transport just increases linearly. That's what you expect. The stronger the wind stress, the stronger the Ekman transport. And that just drives a stronger transport onto the shelf. In these particular simulations, you can see that dense water transport off the shelf uh, is relatively independent of the wind stress. That's because we're just not changing the surface buoyancy forcing. Um, but what's remarkable here is that as you change the wind stress, that interior transport of circumpolar deep water is modified uh, to balance the total mass transport on or off the shelf. Okay, so by changing the surface wind forcing, we're changing uh, the transport uh, of this warm water onto the shelf, which again is moderated by these eddy fluxes uh, onto the shelf. 
And so as the wind stress increases, two things happen here. Uh, the circumpolar deep water transport gets weaker, uh, which is largely due to the fact that these density surfaces tilt over, uh, and they no longer have access to the shelf here. One of the, um, I don't want to say concerning, but one of the, the important results that came out of this study as well is we did another suite of simulations here uh, where we actually changed the resolution. So starting here at a, a fairly coarse resolution of 10 kilometers uh, and moved down to a, a resolution of only 500 meters. Again, because the circumpolar deep water is largely carried by eddies, uh, and the deformation radius in this region is quite small, on the order of 5 to 10 kilometers, and what you find is that as you move to a coarser and coarser resolution, uh, basically that circumpolar deep water goes away, okay? Because you're no longer resolving that eddy transport, uh, which su suggests that actually accurately modeling this transport of warm circumpolar deep water onto the shelf requires numerical simulations that have uh, roughly a 10 to, to I'm sorry, uh, one to two kilometer horizontal resolution. Okay, and just the last picture to show here, as I mentioned, this process model allows us now to, to start to understand the regional variability we're seeing around Antarctica. So what you see on the right-hand side uh, are actually observations of the temperature structure all the way around Antarctica. Uh, so this is in the Bellinghausen Sea, where you see this warm water has access to the shelf. As we move into the Western Weddell Sea, uh, again, it's a, it's a weaker transport here. And then uh, in parts of East Antarctica, you can see that warm water doesn't have any access at all. Uh, what I'm showing on the left is that we can reproduce this density or temperature structure uh, by changing different parameters in this model. And what we see is that the wind stress has a really important role uh, for governing which of, these, uh, which of these density surfaces that host this warm water actually have access to the shelf. Okay. So I'll skip that. I, I do just kind of want to point out this last work. Um, this is a paper actually that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, this is work that, that Andrew Stewart uh, has done, so I wasn't involved in this work. But again, this is based on the simulation that I showed you earlier, that numerical model, uh, and also that uh, Demetrius Menomenalis put together. Um, I've talked mostly now about the, the importance of the wind forcing uh, and also these eddy fluxes. The thing I haven't talked very much about is tides. Um, and so the other thing that this very high resolution model uh, includes is tides. And so I just very quickly wanted to point out what you're seeing in these picture here is once again sort of a similar picture. This is the heat flux uh, onto the shelf. This is distance offshore. Uh, these different colors are the, the mean transport, the eddy transport, and then importantly in the yellow uh, is the tidal transport. And this color here in the purple is the sum of all of them. Um, as you look all the way around Antarctica, the, the story is, is pretty similar. Uh, what you find is that there's a, a large scale or, or uh, compensation, I should say, between the mean transport onshore, so that's due to the surface wind stress, and the contribution from the tide. So these are, these are fluctuations that are happening on sub-daily time scales. And so the total, once I add these, is some small residual of those two. Um, but what's pretty remarkable, and I don't think we completely understand yet, is that that also seems to match up with what the eddy transport onto the shelf is. And, and so this is sort of our current state of understanding now, that the, that the means and the tides uh, are both very large and important, but they tend to, to cancel each other out. If you actually look at this heat flux, uh, sort of this is all of East Antarctica. The other thing this picture shows is that it's, it's very intermittent, uh, and it, the degree to which you have the heat flux onto the shelf here varies uh, significantly from place to place. OK, so I've got about, um, about five minutes left, and I did want to show some of this work. Uh, that's starting to extend our understanding of variability, not just from the regional scale, um, but to the large scale. Now, the way that we've really been able to understand the ocean as a turbulent system, uh, again, at, at the global scale, has been from remote sensing, uh, either looking at SSTs, but perhaps most importantly, from looking at variations in sea surface height. Uh, variations in sea surface height are uh, correlated with lateral pressure gradients, which give rise to uh, our, our surface velocity. And it has always been a challenge to actually obtain sea surface height measurements in regions that are covered with sea ice. Uh, it's true because in these regions, uh, conventional processing fails. Um, however, if we do have a way uh, to recover SSH from regions uh, that are not covered with ice, for example, in Leeds, 
uh, this would give us an opportunity to actually uh, make maps of SSH uh, near the Antarctic margins. And so this is some work um, that uh, has uh, been, as I said, we've been doing in collaboration with Ron Kwok and Tom Armitage. Uh, what you find is that when you look at uh, sea surface height returns uh, from regions that are not ice covered, uh, the, um, these leads appear as, as very, very bright uh, signatures in pulse properties. And so what you're looking at here, uh, this is a return coming from an ice covered region. This is coming from a region where you actually have a lead. And what you can see is both uh, the power here is much, much larger and it's much, much strongly peaked. What this means is we'll actually uh, be able to select those regions that are in the, in the, uh, in the leads and actually recover the sea surface height from these regions. If you actually look at the data we have available uh, before we start looking at these regions uh, where we've made, uh, looked at recoveries from the leads, you can see obviously we have sea surface height all the way around Antarctica and we get into the margins. Uh, what you're looking at here in color is actually number of months where we have returns. We have very, very little data. Uh, we've been using this radar altimetric data coming from uh, Cryosat 2. And when we start looking at our uh, regions in the, both the ice covered and uh, the ice free composites, what we find is we have near circumpolar coverage all the way into the coast uh, and can begin to put together an SSH product. Uh, so what I'm going to show you uh, is an SSH product that uh, Tom Armitage has put together uh, that gives us a six year time series at monthly resolution all the way around Antarctica. Uh, and that's what I'm showing here. Okay, so what you're looking at now is a map uh, of sea surface height. Of course, this is a, the deviation from the geoid. Uh, and so what you see, you can think about this if uh, this is a topographic map. Uh, this is sort of the lowest point in the global ocean. You sort of sit uh, in the bowl here of the Waddell Gyre. Uh, and if I, you were to walk, say, from the Waddell Gyre all the way over to South Africa, uh, your change in elevation here would be on the order of about uh, three meters. Uh, but that pressure gradient, that change in sea surface height, it was what drives this uh, Antarctic circumpolar current. And so this product is its pretty remarkable. It's really the first time we've ever been able to look at surface velocities uh, all the way around Antarctica. And so you can take the gradient in this sea surface height product uh, and actually convert it into a velocity field. So this is showing the velocity vectors. Uh, the colors here are showing the magnitude. So again, the ACC uh, is about a meter per second at the surface, but you can still see um, that you have this Antarctic slope current sort of all the way around Antarctica. Again, because we have uh, six years worth of data for the very first time, we can start to look at the variability of the circulation uh, around Antarctica. And so I'm just pointing out, uh, this is one analysis we did. You're looking at the Ross gyre here. So the color scale has been saturated just to pick out uh, the size of this gyre. Here's the velocity field showing this uh, anti -cyc uh, sorry, cyclonic gyre uh, in the Ross Sea. You can see it's low sea surface height here, high sea surface height, indicating uh, an eastward Antarctic slope current. And then what we're showing on the right-hand side here is the anomaly uh, at, at three monthly scale uh, from this mean picture. And so what you see, if you sort of focus on these two panels here, is there's this large scale sort of tilting back and forth of the sea surface height. So in particular, in the fall, uh, the center of the gyre is anomalously low, and the coast is high, indicating a stronger gradient. Uh, and in the spring, that relaxes back. And so there's this sort of seasonal rocking back and forth that tends to strengthen the Antarctic slope current in the fall and weaken it in the spring. And you actually do this all the way around Antarctica, and you can see that this is actually uh, a circumpolar feature. So this is the change. Uh, in sea surface height between autumn and spring. And what you see is that in autumn, all the way around Antarctica, you have this intensification of the Antarctic slope front. And if you actually look at the seasonal change in the speed of that current, it's up to 100% faster in the fall than it is in the spring, all the way around Antarctica. Okay, and we've never, like I said, never been able to look uh, at the temporal change in these properties on these sorts of time scales before. Um, we can also start to correlate changes in the sea surface height to major modes of climate variability. So we've uh, 
correlated the changes in sea surface height to, for instance, the Southern Oscillation Index, so whether we have El Nino or La Nina conditions, and again, you, you have these very large scale patterns. Um, somewhat more interesting, I guess, if you, if you look at uh, the major climate mode in the Southern Ocean, uh, this is SAM of the Southern Annular Mode. Uh, regions when SAM is positive indicate uh, an intensification of the surface westerly winds and also a contraction around Antarctica. Uh, and when they're weak, they're further away from the coast. Uh, and so what you see is as those westerly winds get contracted towards the coast, uh, you have a, a sinking of the sea level all the way around Antarctica. Now, um, this, this uh, new SSH product is, is fantastic, and there's all different types of things you can begin to think about. Um, one of the pieces of work that we're, we're starting on now is to really try and push the sea surface height variability in terms of what the interior changes look like. Uh, and I think I'll just sort of finish up with this slide here. Uh, what you're looking at on the bottom, uh, this, these are temperature sections, so very similar to the ones I showed you before. This is depth, this is distance in towards Pine Island Glacier. So this is over here in the Amundsen Sea. Uh, again, that warm water floods the continental shelf, uh, it moves under uh, the ice shelf. These are actual measurements. This part here uh, is actually a numerical simulation. Um, but what was pointed out in this paper is that between 2009 and 2012, uh, the thickness or the depth at where that warm water found, was found was very, very different. Okay, and in particular in 2009, uh, that warm water was uh, much uh, deeper and had access to get up and over this bathymetric feature, this ridge under Pine Island Glacier, uh, and flood the base of the ice shelf where more melting was seen. And it was argued that in 2012, uh, that warm water sat much deeper and was impeded getting into the base of the ice shelf because of the bathymetry there. Um, the argument in that paper was that what controls uh, the depth of that warm water was largely due to large-scale atmospheric patterns. Okay? And, and in particular, there were weak El Nino conditions in 2009, but, but La Nina conditions in 2012. Okay? And so the fact now that we can actually match up changes, at least in the sea surface height, which will in some ways uh, be correlated with what the density structure uh, does in the interior of the ocean uh, will allow us to start to understand, right, we, we now sort of understand how the variability in the sea surface height is changing. If we can start to link that up to how that, uh, what that means for the interior density structure, now we have a tool, okay, that allows us to, under, to look at which density surfaces have access to the shelf in a circumpolar sense rather than just looking at various different regions. So that's sort of what, uh, what we're trying to push on with now using all of the sort of in situ uh, observations that are available. So looking at seals, looking at Argo floats, and of course looking at more traditional hydrographic sections. Okay, um, so I think I'll stop there. Uh, I think the thing that I just wanna emphasize to sort of summarize is this, this sort of transition in our thinking about what the circulation of the Antarctic margins look like. Uh, it is a turbulent system where uh, eddies play a very important role. Our ability to simulate these depends on us being able to resolve those very, very small scale features. Uh, and then also, you know, our ability to go in now with different types of observing tools, um, thinking about using instrumented animals or, or marine robotics, uh, has allowed us to explore certainly high frequency processes, but begin to, um, to look more carefully at, at the dynamics that are happening around the margins. And, and the hope now that we can use that information to sort of extend it to, to uh, how this variability is changing circumpolarly. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if there's time, I'd be happy to take a couple questions. Yeah, Alex. Alex, can I ask you to take this? We're recording this, so we want to. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm curious about the seasonal fluctuation in the along shore current. Um, does that mean you expect uh, seasonal fluctuations in ice shelf melt as well? Uh, so increased heat transport depending on the season? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think that's what needs a little bit more work, but the implication would be, especially for the, the, the size of the change we're seeing, right? So, so if you're really gonna accelerate that uh, current by, say it goes from, uh, 15 to 30 centimeters a second, uh, that requires a very large change in your sea surface height gradient, uh, which has to be balanced in some way by 
uh, the interior density structure. So I think the suggestion is, is that right at the shelf break, you will see, you'll see a pretty significant change in which density classes, classes have access to the shelf. Now, certainly in the Amundsen Sea, there's a somewhat torturous route right, for that warm water to go from getting across the shelf break to when it actually gets under, say, Pine Island Glacier or Thwaites or whatever you want to look at. And so whether the seasonality at the shelf break is manifested all the way at the base of the ice shelf, I think that's a little bit less clear, right? Because that those pulses of warm water that get onto the shelf may get mixed out, and that signal might get smeared out by the time you actually start looking at fluctuations in melt rates. But, but that needs to be looked at. Yeah, Ala? Thanks, Andy. You were mostly looking from the outside towards the, uh, the, the Antarctic continent. Are there any indications what the increased melting rates of the ice shelves might be doing uh, to, to all the, uh, the, uh, the patterns that you were um, uh, exploring? Or maybe they don't, ha or maybe that enhanced melting doesn't have an effect. Is there an indication one, one way or, an, or another? Yeah. So. Um so everything I've sort of talked about is you can think of it as a very top-down approach, right? So I can, I can change the surface wind forcing, and how does that modulate the, the transport onto the shelf? Um, absolutely. I, I mean, we've certainly looked at that to a lesser extent. But um, as you're changing the melt rates, you're certainly changing the volume transport of Antarctic bottom water getting off the shelf. Uh, you are also changing the, the density classes in which that goes into. Um, and that will, of course, uh, change the, the transport that you have to have onto the shelf. Um, I think the challenge comes from most of the work that we've been doing, sort of just focusing more on the dynamics, has taken this very, I'm going to take a zonally symmetric sort of approximation of what's happening, in which case, yes, if I change the bottom water transport, I have to balance that by what comes back up onto the shelf. Um, in the real system, you know, where that dense water gets off the shelf, it could be largely governed by topography, uh, various things. And so it's a little bit less clear how that, how that modulates the transport on the shelf. Um, so I mean, the short answer is, is yes. It certainly will, will change that structure. Um, but it's a little bit unclear where you will where you see that, that change be sort of manifested in terms of flux onto the shelf.